uh, these events. DC residents who worked at the Pentagon and postal workers, among others. In addition, on our website, you will find readings suggested by Professor Raskin that complement this salon. We will add to these and encourage you to use them as aids for further discussion. Visit our website at wdchumanities.org for more information on this and other programs of the Humanities Council. We will now have opening remarks by Edward Miller, a distinguished member of our Washington literary and cultural community. He is also a chair of our board, a founding member of the Humanities Council, and host of the television show, The Humanities Profile. Thank On September 11th, I was in Western Pennsylvania on the Penn State Altoona campus. My friend and fellow writer, Dinty Moore, and I stood in his office watching the World Trade Towers collapse again and again on television. Even though we were both writers, we couldn't find words to express what we saw or felt. It was a moment that I knew that silence was very important. That it was a moment for prayer and faith. The time to reflect as an individual and as a citizen. Why was this happening to us? I think it was out of this silence that the question, why do they hate us? seem to blossom like a forgotten weed. But men and women must move beyond silence because what makes us human is the capacity to think, love, judge, and decide our future. To move from silence into dialogue with others requires that we seek a common language. In time of crisis, one looks to one's family, friends, and neighbors for help. One looks to strangers for understanding and support. It is out of this common language that the songs of patriotism are often sung. It is with this common language that we debate and discuss how we will protect ourselves and how we define national security. To our government, and leaders, we ask the following questions. First, who makes the rules to govern how we live? Second, who changes the rules when we hate the way we die? Our democracy rests on the shoulders of the common man and woman. People equal in spirit must accept the responsibility for protecting the common good. When you think about your home, and neighborhood. We want you to think about the humanities and the Humanities Council of Washington. We are an organization seeking the final place in your lives. We want to hear your stories and preserve those things you hold dear. Your values and beliefs are important to us. Your memories will become the history of this city and nation. Programs like the one this evening is a reminder that we are a community that comes together to break bread and fellowship. We believe the exchange of ideas is as essential as the air we breathe. The Humanities Council of Washington is here to transform your lives through the power of the humanities. We fund and sponsor programs so that no night will be too long, no evening too dark. In our small way, we try to uphold the light of truth and civic responsibility. Our board and staff members might be considered dream keepers. The dreams we hold in our hands are yours. We thank you for placing your trust in us. 
and an advisor to the Bureau of the Budget, the Office of Science and Technology, in the, ex in the Executive Office of the President. But in a clearly distinguished resume, I know that he and you will, re will agree with me that his most impressive credit is being the father of Jamie <laughs> Bennett. <Bradley. laughs> Thank you very much. I want to begin perhaps with just a few words about the situation of the uh, But first, to Alex, some people who are here, uh, my daughter in law. Outstanding scholar and teacher of 
written dozens and dozens of articles, popular ones, law review articles, uh, and always in the context of what is the nature of freedom and democracy, what is the nature of responsibility, both in terms of the government, as was pointed out by Ethelbert, to the person and the person to other people in the society. Now, he's just finished a book on the Constitution and the Supreme Court. And this book sets in motion the dialectic between the Supreme Court as a, an instrument not of democracy, but rather of that kind of institutional structure which takes upon itself an ex cathedra view of knowing better. At least that's the way I understand it. So in closing, uh, I want to make one other point. In Yiddish, there's a phrase, mensch. And a mensch is somebody who is humane, who goes beyond a particular social role, who is more, more than his intellectual capacities, and who reaches out to others in empathy and dignity. That's Jamie Rask. Well, let me start by thanking Joy Austin and Ethelbert Miller for this very high honor of speaking before the council. Um, and uh, Ethelbert, you are um, the, the poet laureate of the people every year. And so as uh, an aspiring third-rate poet myself, I'm in awe of everything you've done. And it's a great honor to be able to share the lecture with you. Um, I want to thank my dad for stepping up to the plate here, as profoundly uh, embarrassing as that was. Uh, uh, Sean and uh, the wonderful people at the council had originally suggested that we find a somewhat more conservative voice to, uh, to join with me to sort of counterbalance my ever so slight liberal tendencies. Um, and I warn them that although I know a lot of conservatives, um, that not a lot of them ever seem that enthusiastic about debating me. And so we, we, did, we did try to uh, ask Justice Kennedy, who I've done some stuff with in the past, and whether he would introduce me. But he respectfully declined. And then we went to uh, Judge Kenneth Starr, who's a volunteer with our uh, constitutional literacy teaching program in D.C., and he respectfully declined, and then they went to uh, my law school classmate, Mayor Williams, but he was busy, so he respectfully declined, so the most conservative person they could find was my dad, uh, <laughs> introduced me, and uh, so, Dad, i got to say, uh, you're no Kenneth Starr, but uh, it, it is, it's a, a landmark achievement, nonetheless, to be introduced by you. Um, now, um, the, the council asked me to give you all my wisdom about patriotism in the Constitution, and I had to laugh because this was the same invitation that Justice Kennedy actually, uh, in the Supreme Court Historical Society, extended to me when uh, my book, We the Students, came out uh, last year, uh, and I was invited to go up to the Supreme Court and give them all my wisdom about the Constitution and public education, so I insisted that my wife, Sarah, who is here, come with me. Usually she doesn't come to see me do anything, but I insisted that she come, and uh, you know, I was very excited about, you know, there could be lawyers and justices and clerks there, and I gave this talk, and I sat down, I said, so how'd I do? And she said, well, I don't know how much wiser they are, but they're definitely older. Uh, so, uh, so I brought Sarah tonight to sort of keep an eye on me. Uh, I promise my speech will not be much longer than my introduction. Um, and, um, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to do this. Um, uh, since the, uh, the savage horrors visited on America on September 11th by authoritarian religious fanatics, uh, many people have counterposed patriotism to concern for civil liberties, due process, and constitutional values. Test testifying before Congress, for example, Attorney General Ashcroft told us that those who question his policies on such grounds are giving, quote, aid and comfort to the terrorists. We are thus invited to believe that we can be either patriots or civil libertarians, opponents of mass terror or champions of the Bill of, the Bill of Rights, but never both. On this view, the measure of our patriotism 
um, in this scary new world order is our willingness to surrender civil liberty. I, I want to challenge this formulation, which not only falsely suggests that our system of liberty threatens our security, but which radically degrades the meaning of patriotism. My purpose tonight is to reunite the two sides of the dichotomy, patriotism and the Constitution, and argue for what I will call constitutional patriotism, and then something even larger than that, a patriotism of freedom. What does patriotism mean? Love of country, but as with other kinds of love, patriotism has both debased and advanced forms. At its lowest level, patriotism is a primitive tribal feeling, which leads to militaristic groupthink. This mass psychology hardly merits the name patriotism. George Orwell, who coined the term groupthink, actually distinguished patriotism from this negative force, which he called nationalism. Nationalism requires the submergence of the self into the larger unit of social control. The citizen expresses his or her highest capacities simply by surrendering to the will of the state, which proves its own superiority against enemies, whether real or imagined, in warfare. Patriotism, according to Orwell, does not depend on surrender of the self. It is defined by love of one's community, the people, the institutions, and the ways of life that define a society, and then active commitment to its welfare. Patriotism does not require us to stop thinking, Orwell said, or to abandon the Enlightenment values of toleration and empathy, critical reflection, independence of mind, and rejection of all fanaticism and idolatry. Orwell's understanding of patriotism improves the definition and helps us to resist the current coarsening of public discourse. Many people, such as the second lady, Lynn Cheney, who spent the 1990s denouncing political correctness, now would impose something we might think of as patriotic correctness. Ten years ago, as chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Ms. Cheney made a major speech denouncing political correctness on campus, which she called the new McCarthyism, an effort to impose liberal political views about race and gender, and to, quote, make teaching and learning into the handmaiden of politics. <coughs> she opposed the politicization of universities. Quote, there ought to be an attempt to get at the complex truth of our experience rather than imposing a single-minded political interpretation of it, she said, and one can agree with that very cogently formulated sentiment. But now a group that Ms. Cheney formed, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, is itself seeking to impose on universities a single-minded political interpretation of current events. It released a report in November denouncing America's professors for being the, quote, weak link in America's response to 9-11 and for giving, quote, aid and comfort to its adversaries. Rather than supporting efforts to find what she called a decade before the complex truth of human experience, Ms. Cheney now actually criticized universities for adding courses to study the Islamic world. She said, quote, to say it is important now to study Islam implies that the events of September 11th were our fault. She said, it's what I think is a non sequitur. The group also denounced the dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton for saying that, quote, it's very important for Americans to think about our own history, what we did in World War II to Japanese citizens by interning them. Now, Orwell saw that patriotism cannot mean that we all have to think the same thoughts, nor does it mean that we lose our moral clarity about our enemies simply by being honest about ourselves and our own history. And yet, Orwell's definition of nation-state patriotism as a thinking love of the community still remains morally incomplete. It does not tell us why this or that regime deserves the patriotic commitment of its citizens. Do all nations deserve the patriotism of their citizens? Should the oppressed women of Afghanistan under the Taliban feel patriotic towards their government? Should the oppressed women of Saudi Arabia feel patriotic towards their government? How about African-American soldiers who returned to the Jim Crow South after serving in World War I? How about Jews in Nazi Germany? How about South African blacks under apartheid? How about gays and lesbians discharged from the armed forces today in the United States? These cases suggest that people can feel patriotic toward their nations, but still have criticism of and even antipathy towards their governments. To put it differently, governments must earn the patriotic love that people feel instinctively for their fellow citizens. But how can government do that? The totalitarian method is to force people to love the state through the manipulation of techniques of mass mind control and propaganda. The democratic way is to justify people's patriotism by making the government honestly representative of the people and responsive to their desires. And here's where patriotism connects to constitutionalism. 
Written constitutions are the emblematic feature of democratic nations that come into being through an act of sovereign collective will. The United States is the paradigm case of the unfolding modern constitutional democracy. The first three words of our constitution, we the people, articulated a democratic aspiration that set the horizon of social expectations and unleashed centuries of recurring popular struggle for inclusion and equal membership. In the new century, we are unified not by one race or one ethnicity or one religion or one language or one ideology or one political party. We are unified as a people by one constitution which creates the structure for continuing democratic dialogue and governance to advance the liberty, equality, and happiness for all of us. It is a passionate and reasoned faith in this system of constitutional values that I want to call constitutional patriotism. Constitutional patriotism removes the mystical abstraction from nation-state patriotism, which invites us to worship the idealized entity of the nation simply because this is where we find ourselves living, through birth or immigration. Constitutional patriotism invites us to love our country not because of the accidental fact that it is our country, but rather because it is the home of free and democratic institutions that will nourish our capacities and those of our loved ones and fellow citizens. Patriotism is not then just an act of collective narcissism, but rather an act of political commitment to democratic freedom. On this theory, you see that constitutional patriotism is not a political feeling that stops at the border's edge. The patriots who brought forth America, men like Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson, were globe-trotting internationalists who believed that the spirit and practice of democracy would sweep political despotism and religious superstition from the earth. From a small spark kindled in America, Tom Paine wrote in The Rights of Man, a flame has arisen never to be extinguished. It winds its progress from nation to nation. Here, patriotism is not a divisive force, but a harmonizing force that unifies the people of the earth against all oppressive governments. Patriots stand in solidarity with those who struggle for the same kinds of freedoms they have already won. And if and when democracy comes to all of the people of the world, wars will become infrequent. We will compete against others, not in business <coughs> on the battlefield, but in a friendly spirit on the playing fields and in the markets of commerce. This worldly hope of freedom for me and for everyone else too is the highest form of constitutional patriotism to which we can inspire. Now, what are the patriotic <clears throat> duties of American citizens today? Many hundreds of thousands of American citizens, many of them are here in Washington, D.C., people in the armed services, letter carriers, cops, firefighters, emergency medical rescue technicians, sanitation workers, cleanup crews, nurses and doctors and public health experts, members of the National Guard, people working in homeless shelters and hospitals have already served the nation with courage and distinction in meeting the most urgent tasks at hand. Their patriotism is exemplary. Millions more have contributed money <coughs> to, to the funds for families of victims of 911. And this, too, evokes a kind of solidarity that is deeply patriotic. But what does patriotism mean now? Does it mean simply accepting on faith all of the government's proposals for expanding military, police, intelligence, surveillance, investigatory, and prosecutorial powers and reducing civil liberties? Is it a Patriot's Act to embrace the Patriot Act without even reading, reading it? Is it unpatriotic to debate foreign policy to invoke the Bill of Rights, to disagree? Well, I would argue on the contrary. As constitutional patriots, I mean, we must work to protect and expand the civil liberty and democracy that we're fighting for. Thus, in wartime, we've asked, uh, we have not only asked more of ourselves in terms of personal sacrifice, but more from our government in terms of meeting the ideals that we proclaim. There has been a fascinating historical dialectic, for example, between war and suffrage, as the disenfranchised at home have demanded that the nation live up to its high-minded democratic ideals. The American Revolution, which challenged taxation without representation, unleashed democratic feeling in the land. The Civil War gave us the 15th Amendment and black citizens the right to vote. Suffragettes, including the founders of the Washington College of Law, mounted a campaign for women's suffrage during World War I, which led to enactment of the 19th Amendment when the war was over. And military service by young men in the Vietnam War, combined with youth, youth protests against it, gave us the 26th Amendment and the 18-year-old vote. Today, I do not need to tell any citizens of Washington, our political democracy remains a beautiful ideal, but radically incomplete.
In the fall of 2000, the three-judge panel in Alexander versus Daly, by a vote of two to one, found that Washingtonians have no federally protected constitutional right to vote, saying that equal protection does not protect the right of citizens to vote, but only the right of qualified citizens to vote. And the Supreme Court affirmed the decision. Just several weeks later, in Bush versus Gore, the Supreme Court brought in the point, stating in its five to four vote that the manual recounts could be shut down in Florida and that, quote, the individual citizen has no federal constitutional right to vote. So states can award presidential electors without consulting the people. So more than six million people can be accidentally disenfranchised across the country. So the Supreme Court can decide that truth is irreparable harm, that pregnant chads have more rights than pregnant women, that the remedy for the potential loss of voting rights of a few people is absolute disenfranchisement of a lot more, and that Supreme Court decisions can be like carnival tickets, good for one day only. <laughs> so 600,000 tax-paying, draftable American citizens in the capital city can be disenfranchised and locked out of Congress, which not only declares wars in deciding federal budgets, but ultimately governs local affairs. So one and a half million former felons who have done their time and repaid their debt to society can be disenfranchised in 10 states across America, 300,000 of them in the state of Florida alone. And so millions of citizens who live in federal territories, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, Guam, the Virgin Islands, do not even have a right to vote for president of the United States. The terrorists took the lives of more than 3,000 people, Washingtonians, New Yorkers, Virginians, Puerto Ricans, American citizens of every color, ethnicity, politics, national origin, and religion, including whites, African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, Hindus, straights, gays and lesbians, millionaires, union members, busboys, lawyers, secretaries, teachers, janitors, cops, and firefighters. If we are all under attack, and we are all mobilized to respond, and the government's legitimacy depends on the consent of the governed, then let this be the war that gives us a constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to vote for all citizens and the right to complete representation in Congress for the people of the capital city who are living and working on the front lines of the war against terror. And as with democracy, so with liberty, patriotism forces us to be zealous about the freedoms that we are fighting to protect. Wartime has been perilous for civil liberties, and we almost always come to regret official policy later. The Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798 were used by the Adams administration to prosecute and jail newspaper editors of different political persuasions, and when Jefferson became president, he pardoned them. In 1919, the federal government responded to the bombing of Attorney General Palmer's home by rounding up more than 6,000 immigrants across the country and deporting many of them. With the relocation and internment during World War II of more than 110,000 people, most of them American citizens, we uprooted large parts of the Japanese American community on the West Coast. And the Supreme Court gave the thumbs up in the Korematsu case. Justice Jackson dissented, insisting that in America, guilt is personal and not inheritable, and warned that the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting citizens now lies about like a loaded weapon. In the Vietnam period, the FBI and CIA were implicated in a massive program of political spying, unlawful disruption, and domestic surveillance of the civil rights and anti-war movements. According to the Church Committee in the Senate, the agencies adopted tactics, quote, unworthy of a democracy and occasionally reminiscent of the tactics of totalitarian regimes. The current situation is not remotely so bad, at least for the vast majority of the population, as far as we know. Arab Americans and Muslim Americans who would be the most vulnerable to backlash are in a far better position than were Japanese Americans at the time of Pearl Harbor. There are numerous Arab American elected officials and political appointees, and many more Muslim and Arab Americans in positions of business, media, law, and so on. They live all over America and are integrated and assimilated into the community. Nonetheless, the government has overreacted in some ways, most strikingly with respect to the, to the rights of immigrants without so much as a study of what actually went wrong in our multi-billion dollar intelligence and law enforcement establishments that allowed 9-11 to happen. The administration moved in its Patriot Act and in other measures to dismantle, to dismantle a substantial amount of civil liberty. The very name of the Patriot Act implies that we become patriots by surrendering civil liberty rather than exercising it. 
Since 9-11, the administration has eroded the wall between intelligence gathering and law enforcement, arrested thousands of individuals and held them without criminal charges under a shroud of secret secrecy, continued to detain more than a thousand people, although exact numbers are hard to know since the Justice Department no longer releases them, even though only one person, Zacharias Musawe, has been charged with any involvement in 911. Given the FBI the so-called sneak and peek authority to enter your house or apartment while you were away or sleeping and remove personal items, photograph them, or copy things without telling you about it, given the CIA broad new domestic powers, including grand jury powers, given the FBI expanded wiretapping authority and the power to ask for the entire database of credit card companies, the records of libraries, video stores, hotels, motel, motel telephone companies, and so on, who resurrected the practice of ideological exclusion, damaged the attorney-client privilege by allowing secret and unannounced surveillance of contacts between suspects and lawyers, and issued plans for military tribunals to try permanent residents of the United States in proceedings which would dispense with criminal due process protections such as the right to a public trial, the right to inspect evidence, the right to jury trial, the right to an appeal, and so on. Now, we don't have time to consider um, each of these now, and there will be a discussion of, of this in April here at the Washington College of Law. But the last one, the executive order on military tribunals, is exemplary in that it's basically unnecessary, as is shown by the fact that both Musawe and John Walker Lind are being tried in federal court right now, and violative of due process which protects all persons, including permanent residents. We should never forget that the reason why a majority of the rights in the Bill of Rights are criminal procedure protections is that the framers understood that government is fallible, and we know that there are lots of innocent people who have been on death row after having been convicted of doing terrible things. We need the presumption of innocence and the rules of, evi of evidence, not because terrorists deserve the blessings of constitutional democracy. Surely they don't. But because we don't know who the real terrorists are without the due process system that we have evolved over the ages. Now, the administration is still working on its specific regulations. And for all I know, they might be um, withdrawing the general thrust of the order. The point I want to make is that carefully examining in debating this proposal, <clears throat> or any other proposal in wartime, is not an act of disloyalty, but rather an act of patriotism. As the Supreme Court said in 1866 in Ex parte Milliken, the Constitution was intended for a state of war as well as a state of peace, and is equally binding upon our rulers and our people at all times, under all circumstances. The freedoms and values we are defending belong to the people, not to the government. And the government itself belongs to us. In a democratic society, in our society, the highest office you can hold is not that of Homeland Security Czar, or Secretary of Defense, or even President of the United States. It is that of citizen. And we fulfill our obligations as democratic citizens when we speak and listen, analyze and debate, when we guard our fellow citizens' constitutional freedom zealously, when we reach for the best in our culture and in, a, and in our humanity, and when we always, always, always think for ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, 
so you know, I experienced all of those emotions, and I still experience those emotions. Um, but but I've become more grateful over time, rather than less, about the structure of the rule of law being here to uh, protect all of us. Um, and I've been really cheered by the extent to which the public gets the point about civil liberties and civil rights, um, much more so, I think, than some people in government do. Um, and, um, you know, the, again, the, the public's reaction was marked tremendous progress over the public's reaction, say, uh, during World War II, the attack in Pearl Harbor, the treatment of the Japanese Americans. I mean, people understood right away, not every Arab American is guilty of this. The extreme vast majority have nothing to do with this and oppose it, and the same with Muslims and so on and so forth. Um, but I think that that's a victory of the rule of law, the idea that we do oppose uh, guilt by association, we do oppose collective guilt, we do have an idea that people are guilty for things that they do themselves as individuals and not uh, by virtue of being connected to somebody else. You know, that's a, a principle that people in DC should understand very clearly because that there was a way in which um, nobody wanted to even talk about the disenfranchisement of people in Washington while Marion Barry was mayor on Capitol Hill because they said, well, if you elect Marion Barry mayor, you know, how can we accord you the rights that all other American citizens have? Um, you know, as if, as if democracy is something, you know, it's sort of a little bonus you get for being good. Uh, but, but even beyond that, that you, even if you took that attitude, that you can punish 600,000 people because of, you know, the, the flaws of one man. Um, and so, you know, this is the cardinal principle of law, that uh, we don't punish people as a group, and legislatures don't uh, mete out punishment. And, um, and we punish people for things that they've done, and we punish them proportionately. You know, when we look at sports, um, whether it's singing the national anthem or something like that, God bless America, God is always brought into the conversation, into the dialogue. How do you draw a line between patriotism and religious beliefs? There's a, another great question because, um, um, you know, there, there was, there was a, uh, a great turning towards religion and religious faith after 9-11. Uh, and again, I felt the tug of that very strongly. I mean, our kids are um, in Sunday school, and it's hard not to talk about it in religious terms. But um, again, um, yeah, I began to think um, there's, there's a lot of religion in what took place here. I mean, from some people's perspective, uh, September 11th was a faith-based initiative, and we shouldn't uh, kid ourselves about that. Uh, the people who support the, you know, the unspeakable violence visited against us thought they were doing it for religious reasons and religious purposes, and I think that we have to, you know, uh, I, I brought with me the statements that were made immediately after by um, Jerry Falwell and um, Pat Robertson, who were on TV, um, and um, you don't have to read. That. I won't read it. I, you know, I want to say one thing, which is, you know, Falwell said we made God mad, and God lifted the curtain on us. And uh, Robertson uh, adds that we probably got what we deserve. I think it was Robertson who said that. Um, but basically, they blamed the ACLU, uh, abortion. Um, gays and lesbians were very high up on the list. And they say essentially we've mocked God and now we've gotten what we deserve. And it occurs to me, well, there are at least three religious leaders on earth who think that September 11th was the product of divine will. Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and Osama bin Laden. They all agree with that. The rest of the world sees that when you've got, you know, maniac suicide bomber terrorists who train for two years to fly airplanes in the buildings, that is the handiwork of man, not the handiwork of God. Um, and so, you know, I think that we, we have to deal with um, reason, and we have to we have to look at the role that religious mania is playing, you know, in some of these conflicts. Well, what happens to the peace movement during times of patriotism? What do pacifists do? Well, I, I you know I wish I could say I was a pacifist, but I am not ethically advanced enough to be one, and uh, and uh, I've supported the action in um, uh, in Afghanistan and. Um, you know, I, I think that 
that pacifism, you know, sh must remind us whether we think we have a just war or not, um, that the means of war are always bloody and devastating. And, you know, I, I feel ashamed as someone who supported the war about the losses of civilian life and the, the you know, incredible bloodshed that took place in Afghanistan. And I don't know what to say about that. I, I, I should, I want to recognize somebody who's in the audience if I could. Um, um, there's a, a case some of you probably know about called Tinker versus Des Moines School District, where the Supreme Court upheld um, the First Amendment right of a young woman who wore a black armband protesting the Vietnam War. Um, and it was the case that established that young people do have First Amendment rights. And she was coming from a religious perspective, and I think a pacifist one. And her name is Mary Beth Tinker, and she's here with us tonight. And uh, if you guys better addressed to, to people who have ascended to the level of pacifism, but I, I can't say I'm there yet. So. Okay, we'll deal with you if you're alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this gets back to some of your comments. Yeah. Since 9-11, there's been considerable discussion about military tribunals, um, privacy, uh, expanded wiretapping, detention of non-citizens, <coughs> eavesdropping on attorney-client conversations, access to college students' records, uh, internet restrictions. That's a long list. What would you consider to be the, the greatest threat, you know, the thing that we should really look at, and should really monitor? Well, the most immediate threat is not probably to, you know, the people in this room. It's to immigrants, people here as permanent residents, um, who have been rounded up. And there is a tendency on our part to think, well, that, that doesn't touch us because, um, you know, that can't affect us. But there are people who've been held um, on secret evidence without charges for many, many weeks now. Um, that, that's a pretty serious thing, you know, in a free society where our 14th Amendment talks about the due process rights of persons, not of citizens, but of persons, of everybody. Um, so I think that's an immediate thing. But uh, all of the things we talked about in terms of uh, wiretap authority, in terms of expanded domestic um, um, powers of the CIA and the idea before was always to, to build a wall between intelligence activity and law enforcement activity. All of these things will, will stay with us um, afterwards. It's very hard to go back. And so, um, you know, only Senator Feingold was really willing to vote against it because the Patriot Act was called the Patriot Act. And so specific means that were being suggested became conflated with our patriotism. And I think we have to resist the tendency to stamp one part of a public debate about a particular policy measure, patriotic or unpatriotic, but we should try to talk about them in as rational a way as we can. You know, many times we talk about democracy, um, but sometimes the dialogue and discussion doesn't extend to what we might define as the other. In this case, it might be Muslims, Arab Americans, or beginning with African Americans, it could be women. How do the other fit in? look at our American society. For example, when we go back to the statement, you know, why do they hate us? Well, when you look at America, we pretty much look at the entire world. Yeah. Well, if you look at who was, uh, you know, assassinated by the terrorists on September 11th, uh, it's an incredible rainbow spectrum, not just of American society, but of humanity. And people from, I think, over 30 countries were in, you know, one of the buildings um, that got hit. I, you know, I... I'm someone who happens to think that American immigrant democracy is the multicultural wonder of the world. I mean, as horrific as our racial history has been in ways, it is the mechanisms of democracy and freedom that are built into the Constitution that have allowed us to arrive at a point where, um, you know, we have a room like this, and people don't remark on the fact that we have people from so many different cultures and backgrounds, and I, you know, and I think that's what the glory of America is. I think that's why America continues to be a beacon to the rest of the world. Before I open up to uh, questions from you guys, I, I want to ask you this question, which I think is, is also important. Uh, before 9 11, our nation had a, a lesson of democracy in, in, in Florida. Uh, what impact did the last presidential election have on our society, and have these lessons been overshadowed by recent events? Well, and you know, what, what I was trying to do with my talk was to say, that 
our democracy is as strong as the constitutional structure which invites and permits citizen participation and belonging. And our constitutional structure is rickety, it's flawed. And the, you know, the most basic thing, which is now in the vast majority of constitutions on Earth, the South African Constitution being a great model, is the right to vote. And we have our Supreme Court um, a year ago saying we don't have a constitutional right to vote. That is something, that is a de constitutional defect that we need to remedy. And it is the opportunity to get the long-suffering, disenfranchised residents of Washington, D.C. to vote, too. What did you give in terms of electoral college? I, I think the electoral college should be abolished. I think if, you know, if we want to be one nation, we cannot think of ourselves as um, 51 separate units that cast their electors in different ways. We should have one election with one ballot all across the country where we actually have uh, an election result announced. We never have an election result announced because we have 51 units, and so essentially the corporate networks get to determine who's going to be president or who's not. They're the ones who get to say, well, we'll call it now or we won't call it now, and we saw the importance of that in the last election. It, it's really time to update and modernize the Constitution and have a real presidential election that includes everybody. So that I won't be the one voice in the room, I'm going to open it up to discussion. Uh, any questions that you have? Yes. Can you step to the... <laughs> I'm a second generation American. I don't mean this to in any way sound uh, anti-immigrant. I think this is really a failure of the INS and the Justice Department more than uh, anything else. But do you not see any distinction in the way that the Constitution is obligated to treat people who are here contrary to our laws, people who take advantage of the failure of the INS and the Justice Department, and those who have availed themselves of our proper processes and are here Yes. Um, well, let's see. They're, they're all persons, and um, you know, prior to 911, the case law on this was that um, you know, we can have very uh, harsh immigration laws where people are automatically deportable for doing this or that. Obviously, something that couldn't get a U.S. citizen deported. Um, you could be deported for it. But in the process, there were basic due process protections that were accorded you procedurally. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm very dubious that they're being followed for the people who are incommunicado. Um, and certainly, that's the spirit of uh, the November 13th executive order by President Bush saying that it's permanent residents, green card holders in America, um, who can be. Um, brought before military tribunals without any presumption of innocence, with um, a tenuous right to counsel, with no requirement of uh, jury unanimity, no uh, no federal rules of evidence, and so on and so forth. And th th I, I think that that's deeply problematic. I quite agree with you, and I'm pointing out that because in your discussion you, you did not draw any distinctions entirely persons, and that was not in the way it's distinguished. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I, yeah, I don't think that, there, there are a couple of major respects with, in which non-citizens don't have the rights of citizens. In most places, they don't have voting rights, although in a few localities, they do have voting rights. Um, and then they don't have any rights necessarily to stay in the country the way that a citizen would. Um, you know, I don't think that whatever happens to John Walker Lindy can be deported for what he did. As a citizen, he would, you know, be subject to punishment in the United States, but people who have not yet become citizens, who have not crossed the line between uh, non-citizen citizens, can be sent out of the country. That, that, that's absolutely right. Thank you. Sure. Uh, would you comment on whether we constitutionally are at war. And what I mean by that question is uh, Americans are willing to uh, accept a degradation of their rights uh, in a state of emergency or in a war where they think they've got to stand fast to protect the country. But in what sense is a war on terror, terrorism a war? It's a war that can never be won. It's a war where the president can stay there for eight years and keep picking on targets and saying, you're a terrorist. Uh, 
you see where I'm going with I see where you're going, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, in a constitutional sense, only Congress has the power to declare war. Um, and the separation of powers is very important in moments like this because this is the time when the executive branch begins to consolidate a lot of power. Um, the framers, of course, were very fearful of a large standing army for the reason that you say, that we would, that we would be constantly tempted to be in wars. Um, and you know, we would continually, once a war finished, we would seek out another opportunity for a war. Um, but I'm with what I think is the spirit of your remarks, which is I think we need to get back to a constitutional conception of war, that a war is something that is declared by Congress against an enemy and is pursued by the executive branch for that purpose, but that we are not in a permanent state of war. Now, we might be, um, you know, we might be in a heightened state of security readiness where we, you know, we have this large intelligence establishment and they, they've been doing their thing at least since 1947, and presumably that will continue to go on, but we shouldn't, you know, whatever the merits of that intelligence establishment, we shouldn't conflate that with the constitutional idea of war. I mean, this goes back to the war on drugs, where, you know, the war, you can view the war on drugs. I saw one congressman, uh, one late night watching C-SPAN saying it's time to merge the war on drugs and the war on terrorism. Um, so we have, you know, a permanent war on drugs and terrorism, and it's been operating very much in, in the same way. I think September 11th um, let us know what a real military enemy looks like and what real war looks like. Um, and we shouldn't confuse that with, um, you know, our, the, the essentially medical problem of people abusing illegal drugs. Well, that adds into the question of the war against nations and the war against ideas. Yeah. You know, it seems as the, the, the Constitution, we're looking at war against nations, yeah. not war against ideas. Right. Now, of course, the Constitution is ambiguous on that. It says Congress has the power to declare war, but the historical practice has always been, and I think you could say the constitutional presumption has been that war is declared against other nation states, or, you know, at least nation state like groupings, which have, you know, the some means of some monopoly on violence within their group against us. And so on that theory, I guess, you know, the, the Taliban or even Al-Qaeda could apply. But the idea of a war on drugs, you know, takes us away. Or even a war on terrorism, just generally speaking, because as you say, um, it, terrorism has been around for a long time. And we'll probably, you know, we, we will always be able to find it. You mentioned that the Constitution unites our nation, um, but how would you reconcile that statement with the fact that a vast majority of our population knows little about the Constitution? Uh, well, okay, so this is why it's dangerous to invite your students. <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting question because um, we know that ignorance of the law is no excuse in the criminal law context. So if, if you're picked up for doing something that's against the law, you can't say, I didn't know.